Hi, hello, I hope you're taking care of yourself. If you're new here, my name is Lexi, and today we're gonna be talking about all of the books that I read in both September and October of this year. We're just gonna smash them together into one video. I didn't do a wrap up last month because I was in the actual trenches of editing my Dark Academia reading vlog, and by the time I had the space in my schedule to do another video, it would have been way too late for a wrap up to come out. I would never have been able to show my face on YouTube again, and neither of us want that, so I've just decided to do them together this month so I stay caught up, and maybe this will just be how I do it now. I don't know, it really depends. I gotta keep you on your toes. Both reading months were really good for me. I got through 12 books each month, I think. That sounds right. I think there are 10 of these books that I've already talked about in some capacity, so I'm going to try to go quicker through those sections and I'll direct you to the videos if you want to see something more in depth. Even with those, my opinions on them have matured with time, so there will be new things to unpack. I hate shutting up. I could talk about this forever if you let me, but I'm not going to let myself, okay? I'm going to try to keep the pace up so we're not here for the next 17 hours. So diving right in, going chronologically, I started off September reading Shit Cassandra Saw by Gwen E. Kirby. Genuinely feels like 12 years ago that I read this book. I feel like a different person. It's only been like 61 calendar days since I was the girl that I was when I was reading this, but I remember this book as if I read it in 2016. That's how far away this memory is in my mind. This is a really fast paced short story collection. It's like 300 pages, but also the pages have such large margins that really with standard formatting, this would probably be a 200 page book. And all of the short stories thematically explore women who are reacting to a violent world and to complicated relationships with their family, with their female friends. And there's a lot of short stories in here that explore those themes with paranormal elements. And overall, I gave this a 3.5, which feels a little bit high two months down the line, just with how little I remember this and how unlikely I think it is that these stories will stick with me, which sounds way meaner than I wanted to because this book is not bad. Like it's well-written, it's fun, it's very creative for sure, but it felt a little bit disjointed and it had that problem that short story collections often have for me where there are a couple of stories that I thought were standouts that were really good. And then a lot of the rest of the collection was just almost a waiting room for the next really good story. Next, I read Strong Female Character by Fern Brady. This book just came out a few months ago, I think, which is a really fast turnaround for me. Normally Normally when I'm recommended books or I find out about them, they have to like sit in stasis in my brain for over a year. I just always have like dozens of potential physical TBR books cooking up here, waiting for the perfect time for me to buy them. But this one I got to almost instantly after hearing about it and I would strongly recommend it. I gave it four stars. If you've never heard of Fern Brady before, she's a comedian and she was also on a season of Taskmaster. She's just really funny and you can definitely see her humor in the book. But the main reason I found this so good is because of its subject matter, which is Fern discussing her late diagnosis of autism as an adult and how her experience as an autistic woman was completely mishandled by the mental health system in the United Kingdom. I'm sure that there are books like this in the indie market, but I've never seen like a triple A big publisher memoir by a neurodivergent person before. I don't know if I've ever talked about this explicitly on my channel before, but I was diagnosed with ADHD and general anxiety disorder a couple of years ago now. Medication for me was transformational. My brain, not very effective without it, it turns out. But as somebody who also went completely undiagnosed through the schooling system and also had parents who did not believe that there could be something wrong with my brain, it's just very affirming to read a book like this by somebody who has gone through a similar experience and come out the other side successful and okay and for the most part on an upwards trajectory with her life. And I thought that this book, at least from my perspective, captured a lot of the ways that especially neurodivergent women learn to mask so that way they can go completely unnoticed by just quashing parts of their personality that do not fit with what society tells them to do and how that will eventually spiral out of control because that's not tenable for somebody who is neurodivergent to just like erase the parts of themselves that make them who they are. Nobody can do that forever, it turns out. I didn't give this five stars for a couple of reasons. There were just some ideas in the book that I wish were explored a little bit more, just some places where I feel like things could have been fleshed out in a way that was more coherent, but it's still really, really good. Would recommend, especially if you're a neurodivergent person or you love somebody who's a neurodivergent person, or if you just want to be a good citizen of the world and broaden your understanding of things that people go through. It's just really good for that. Sometimes during the process of reading those two books, I also did a close reading of this book, Twisted Love, for my recap video that I posted last month. And I'm really proud of that video. I still think it's a banger, so I'm gonna keep this one short to try to entice you into watching it if you haven't already. But I gave this book one star. <laughs> this is not your grandmother's billionaire romance novel, okay? There's something honestly special about the absolute chaos that unfolds in this book. The absolutely ridiculous descriptions of the leading man, the endless villain monologues that happen during the second half of this book. And if you're anything like me, it ends up being a weirdly enjoyable reading experience in the same way that reading a Wattpad romance novel under the covers off of your mom's Kindle Fire when you were 12 is an enjoyable reading experience. That's the nostalgia that this book unlocked inside of me. But even so, 
still, I could not give it anything more than one star because the male lead is a genuine psychopath. This is an open borders kind of man, okay? Like never once has he or will he respect a single boundary. It's just never been done before. And it was just not as cute for me as it was clearly intended to be in this book. So that's why this got one star and also a video. It just brought something out in me. And with that, we're gonna skip ahead a little bit because I did read the second book in the series this month. That's Twisted Games. And this is a romance that's between the princess of a small fictional European nation who just happens to be besties with the very normal girl protagonist of the first book and her new bodyguard who is an ex-navy seal and it's a forbidden love kind of situation because Eldora has some kind of dumbass archaic law that forbids royals from marrying people of common peasant birth just some dumb shit like that and Bridget has to take this law like through parliament to repeal it so she can have her mans like how these books continue to exist in the same universe continues to amaze me but I give this 1.5 it's just boring it's really long and there's no reason for it like the plot never reaches even close to the levels of unhinged that Twisted Love had and the male lead is cookie cutter basic to the point where I'm not convinced that Bridget isn't just hallucinating a man out of a piece of stale white bread. I'm gonna read the other two books in the series this weekend. Actually that's my plan. That's gonna be a fun time. Bet you wish you were there. Just to see if it's worth doing a video on this book so I can get to those ones because dude my awful jokes about Eldora's opinions on border control and NATO would have to carry the plot of this book through an entire video because there's just nothing there. But if the other two books are worth it, if there's content there as I've been told that there might be then I'll power through. We'll see. But that's why you haven't seen this video yet, even though I finished this book almost a month ago. I just haven't decided if it's worth making. Time will tell. Okay, back on schedule, back in September, the next book that I read was Young Jane Young by Gabrielle Zevin. This was on my fall TBR. I'm actually making some progress through that. I don't want to speak too soon, but... I might even get through all of it. And the premise of this book is best described as fan fiction about the Monica Lewinsky scandal, where Monica is still canon, like that still happens, but there's just another one after her between the senator and his young intern. And the book is divided up into five sections that follow five different women who were all involved somehow in the scandal or in its aftermath. I gave this 3.5 stars. Overall, I liked it. I mean, it's definitely not my favorite book by Gabrielle Zevin by any stretch of the imagination. Like, I wonder what book that could be. Like, I never talk about it. I never bring it up on this channel. But even though this isn't my favorite book by her, it was still a pretty good read. It's feminist in exactly the ways that you would expect a story like this to be. And I still think that we have a ways to go as a society before we are properly empathizing with the young women who are involved in quote unquote affairs like this with much older men. So it was a worthy read for that reason. But in terms of negatives, just as a result of the way that the story is set up, some of the perspectives were more effective for me than others were. And also I just wish that we gotten like a little bit more from the ending than we did. That's why it's a three five, but it was still really good. No. Next up, I read Emergency Contact, which has this really cool bargain price sticker on the cover. And let me tell you, I'm really glad that I didn't pay more than $4 for this book because it was very, very much not for me. This is about these two older teens who find that they don't really have anybody in their life that they trust. And for reasons, even though they're strangers, they end up being each other's emergency contact and they start texting all of the time and then they fall in love from there. And it's supposed to be really cute. That was why I picked this up because dude, I chose this book looking for something chill and readable and young adult romance and fun. I was in a dangerous position, okay? I could feel myself slumping. I was deep in the trenches of editing my Twisted Love video and this is what I picked up and I can never forgive myself for that. This book sucked. I gave it a 1.5. I'm sorry, someone had to be brave enough to say it. Like, obviously this is just my opinion and if you loved it, then I think that's really good. That's great. Books are here differently for different people. I never want to make you feel bad about yourself for liking something. That's not why I'm here. But I personally was so mad that I picked this up. It's like trying to be literary fiction in terms of having excessive description and very little plot and completely unlikable characters but it's also young adult and nothing is ever fleshed out completely and the protagonist is awful she literally slut shames her own mother like constantly in this book not to be dramatic but i felt stronger than the troops when this shit was over just really truly not for me so after that disaster i still needed the dopamine of reading something like easy and fun and cute and light so i went and i picked up the simple wild this is a small town big city romance that follows this rugged pilot man and this girl who is visiting her estranged father in alaska after she learns that he has cancer i gave this book a 3.5 like like truly at war with myself and my opinions because the man sucks. This man hates that she wears makeup, right? And likes clothes and is in his view too materialistic to belong in the small town with her dad. So when she comes to visit, he steals all of her stuff and hides it and never comes clean to tell her where he's hidden any of it until she's the one who finds it like a week or two later. And she's only mad at him for a couple of pages and then she forgives him and then they fall in love. Like if a man did that to me, it would be on site. It's just the kind of weird internalized misogyny 
misogyny that I thought that we were collectively trying to leave behind in the era before the Barbie movie, before the fun pink fits, if you know what I mean. Anyways, I still rated this book pretty highly because A, they do have some cute moments. I don't know. Like there was a lot of cognitive dissonance when I was reading this book, but I can't deny that some of the scenes I was like, aww. But even more than that, it was because the main subplot of this book is the main character reconnecting with her absent father after she and her mom like left many, many, many years ago when she was almost too young to remember him. And this is like her first time talking with him and catching up with him in like 20 plus years. And it made me cry. Like I just found it to be so heartwarming and bittersweet. And the way that the relationship was done was just really, really good. And it came out of like completely nowhere, left field for me. It was not what I expected going into this book. So yeah, mixed bag. I don't know if I recommend this. Like it could still be worth reading, but your mileage really may vary depending on what you're looking for. Just know thyself on this one. Okay, next up, knocking some more stuff off of my fall TBR because I'm just a stud. I also read this entire trilogy during this time period. If you've never heard of A Darker Shade of Magic, this is a series that takes place in a universe that has these four parallel worlds that are all connected through the city of London. And in this collection, we have like post-apocalyptic London where nobody can go anymore because some terrible event happens long ago, so it's quarantine. We have emaciated and violence London, which borders post-apocalyptic London in the way that the worlds can border. And therefore, as a result of corruption, question mark, it's kind of unclear. It's also kind of dying. Then we have magical paradise London, where everybody does elemental magic and lives in harmony with each other for the most part. And then of course, we have earth normal boring London, which has no magic. Some of the characters in this book can hop between Londons. And one of them, Cal, does so in part to smuggle things between worlds, which is super illegal, by the way. Like he absolutely should not be doing that. And at some point during his adventures, something awful happens and it's kind of his fault. So he has to fix it. And he and this completely random girl named Lila from normal London have to bond together to defeat various evils throughout the trilogy. That's what the series is about. I'm going to talk about these all at once, even though I read this one in September and these two in October, just because that's easier. But in terms of rating, in order, I would give these a three, a two, and then a four. I initially gave this first book a 3.5 off of what I saw as the potential of the world and of the series. But then the second book made me so bitter that I ended up demoting this to a three. I don't care if that's fair or not. Okay. There are no rules here. I'm just a girl. This first book is a pretty typical quest fantasy. Nothing too crazy happens. The plot is fairly straightforward for the most part, but most importantly to understand my feelings on this book and also the rest of the series, the characters are really cliche. The main character, Kel, is this brooding, angsty, private man who is also fiercely loyal to the people that he loves. And Lila, the only female character, by the way, that's really fleshed out in the series as a whole, is just aggressively not like other girls. She's good at everything and she's sassy and she's adventurous and she's such a spitfire, you know? She just does crazy things because that's what a girl who's not like other girls would do. They would do crazy things. But with that said, this didn't bug me as much in the first book. I actually still found this to be mostly enjoyable to read. Let me be clear when I say that giving a book three stars is not a bad rating, okay? Like it's average, it's fine. It's an experience that was pretty good overall. That's what a three is to me normally. But the second book, uh, if I can grab it. The second book in the series really disappointed me. I feel like the series is at its best when it's focused on the world building and the history of the four Londons and how everything kind of fits together. And the second book is where we got the least of that. It's a book that's very focused on character and relationship development, which would be fine if a significant portion of this book was not Lila being pathologically annoying about how different she is and how special and how much she hates female beauty standards and wearing dresses and doing anything that is girly. And also just her tendency throughout the series to be reckless and stupid and really selfish and never face even a single consequence for her behavior. The saving grace for this book was the introduction of a new character who reminded me a lot of Nikolai from Shadow and Bone. The two of them honestly served exactly the same role in the trilogy. Like they both took a dying series with characters that annoyed me, that made me mad, and they convinced me to keep pushing forward. And let's be completely honest with ourselves. Like Nikolai characters are also cliche, but I'm an honest woman and that's my kind of cliche, okay? I will eat that up every single time. And I also really liked his romance subplot in these books as well. And last of the trilogy, and by far, in my opinion, the best of the series, I thought that The Conjuring of Light was actually really good. I feel like whether the series is worth it for you will depend on how much Lila and Similar will annoy you and also whether you can take the slow pace of book two. But if you can, this was kind of what I wanted the first book in the series to be, as weird as that sounds. And also just everything as a whole. I think if it were more like this, I would have liked it a lot more. This is also a quest fantasy, but we have a lot more characters as a result of the rest of the trilogy. So it has this found family vibe that I think was really cute. But the best part of this book for me by far was there's this anti-hero kind of character in this book who gets a full redemption arc throughout the story. And you really get to dig into his history and his personality and just all of the terrible things that he's gone through in his life. And he ends up more complex and fleshed out than like the rest of the cast combined. I just loved him, okay? I wanted him to be happy. I wanted to build him a nice little home by the sea where he could rest his weary head. I wanted more for him than what the world had in store. That together with a pretty fast paced and entertaining plot and a return to form on world building made this a strong four star book for me. But I can't in good faith like unilaterally recommend the entire series.
series. I am glad I read it. I'm glad it's off my TBR. I'm glad I finally know like what happens in these books with these really pretty covers, but I definitely understand and agree with a lot of the criticism that I've seen. Okay, these next four I read in my Dark Academia vlog, and I really went in depth on my feelings in that video, especially comparatively with all of the books and how they kind of exist in conversation with each other. So I'm gonna keep this pretty brief. I would recommend that video if you're interested. First of all, The Secret History. What's it about? So you have this group of students who are studying underneath this eclectic and highly private professor, and they're all just freaks. They're obsessed with Greek and Latin and also each other, and then one of them ends up dead. You learn this like from the first page as a result of all of these obsessions. And the story explores what leads up to that event and also everything that happens in the aftermath, all from the perspective of this random guy who just moves up to this school from California and ends up somehow like walking ass backwards into this group of students. I ended up giving this book three stars. It wasn't completely worth the hype for me, but it's a book that I still liked. I think that thematically in concept, it's absolutely brilliant, but in execution, I found the book to be frequently pedantic and annoying with how hard I felt like it wanted to hit you over the head with what it was trying to say. And I understood it. I got the point, you know, like I can see why she chose to structure it this way, but just it was not the kind of thing that I enjoy in books. Also, side note, I got a few comments that I found really funny in that video where it was just people who were like, maybe if you actually read Plato and Homer and the classics, you would understand this book. It's just embarrassing for you to talk like you know so much when everything is clearly going over your head because you haven't read the classics. And all I want to say to that is just how do you so thoroughly miss the theme and the point of this book that you unironically write out that comment and then think to yourself, yeah, what a dunk. That'll show her. Like, I just found that so funny. <laughs> Moving on, next up from that blog, we have A Deadly Education, which is a fantasy book about this girl who is at this school where everything is just super dangerous. Like the school is trying to kill all of the students basically all of the time for plenty of reasons that are explored to death in this book because probably 75% of this is just description of the way that the world works and the school works and the society of the community of wizards works. And if you hate that vibe and that style of just very explicit, we are world building right now sections in your books, you will hate this. This is not for you. But I found the world to be fascinating and I really liked the sarcastic kind of wry tone that the narrator had throughout the story. So I ended up giving it four stars. I also found the romance subplot to be pretty cute, which I didn't even know that this book was supposed to have a romance subplot. So that came out of nowhere, but it was appreciated. All right, next up I read If We Were Villains, which is basically the secret history, but again, except make it Shakespeare and also make the relationship dynamics like really, really juicy. I found the overall reading experience to be a lot better with this book than with The Secret History, but I only ended up giving it 3.5 stars. And what knocked it down a little bit is that there are just so many Shakespeare lines in this book that the characters just say in casual conversation because they're massive fucking nerds. And I am so deeply unfamiliar with Shakespeare that I always felt like I was missing out on a significant part of the story through the subtext of those conversations, which sucked. And there was nothing I could really do about it because it's not like I'm going to go off and read Shakespeare's entire catalog just so I can understand every reference in this book. So it just was what it was. I still liked it. I thought that the ending was superb, but the Shakespeare bits just took me out of it. And then finally, my superstar of that video, I read Babel by R.F. Kuang. I love this book. I was and still am obsessed with it. It's the only five star read in this video. Not to spoil there, there are some other very high ratings that await you, but this is the only perfect five. The premise of this honestly is too complicated for me to want to explain briefly in this wrap up, but it's a dark academia, linguistics focused urban fantasy that explores themes of colonization and oppression and revolution, but also grief and loyalty and love. And it's just brilliant. I bawled my eyes out reading this book. I like emptied a part of my soul into the world and into my vlog. I just love this book. And I'm really mad at myself that I didn't buy any of the gorgeous special editions because I put off reading it for like a year for no reason at all. So nobody knows why I do the things that I do, but you can't win them all. During filming on that vlog, the book that I was reading at night before I went to bed was Smoke It's In Your Eyes. And this is a memoir by a woman who worked in a crematory and also just with funeral services in general during her early 20s. And the book explores how all of her experiences working in those places shaped her views on death and dying and just like connection with the fellow man, you know? I'm pretty sure that this woman, Caitlin Doty, is like mildly internet famous. I was not familiar with her before reading this. You definitely don't have to be, but if you already love her, then this is probably especially worth looking into for you. But I gave this book three stars, which again is good. It's just not super memorable. I've been on a bit of a death kick recently in terms of my reading list. And I think that this book was really hurt by the fact that I read it so close to finishing Being Mortal, which is an outstanding book that honestly makes a lot of the points that this book makes, but in a different way that I personally found to be a little bit more effective. This one is also a lot funnier. There's a lot of humor in the way that Caitlin writes about her experiences, even when what she's doing is honestly very deranged and gory and disgusting. You know, it's just pretty graphic about the affairs that happen in a crematory, just what you would expect would happen there. She really, really describes it for you. And if you're interested in learning about that or exploring that part of the world, if you find that to be fascinating, then this would probably work well for you. Okay, and with that, we are officially into October. This is Berlin, which was my first book for this month. And this book is a literary fiction look at this rich girl who just pathologically lies all of the time and 
ruins her own life for fun. She does nothing else with her time. And randomly, because again, she's rich and kind of insufferable, she moves to Germany to do all of those things, but there instead. And weird shit just starts to happen to her in her life from there. The main character in this book is a crazy person. Like she's just really self-destructive and does crazy things all of the time for no reason, except maybe there's a reason. And we start to unpack that as the book moves forward. And I'm always like pretty embarrassed when I relate to characters like this in books, but low key, like there were moments of this book where I was like, wow, oh no, is this me? And I will not be unpacking that any further at this time, but this is short, it's fast paced. I think I gave it either a three or a 3.5 correction here. And now that I've talked about it on camera, I don't think that I'll ever think about this book even one time ever again. But if you're looking for woman manipulator fiction, she's your girl, she'll be a good one. I followed that up for some reason with The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls, which is a book I've been meaning to get to for a while. This is a memoir that's about a woman who grows up in this just very dysfunctional family. Her dad's an alcoholic, her mom is just kind of a free spirited freak and clearly neither of them were prepared to have children and yet they reproduced like five times and now the entire family has to bear the consequences of those actions and the author reckons in this book with both her escape from this childhood into a life that is pretty nice in the modern day but also the love that she still has for her family and has always had for her family despite all of the things that her parents put her through during her childhood. I gave this book four stars it's very similar in terms of tone and subject matter to Educated which if you've been paying attention on this channel is one of my favorite books but this just didn't hit quite as much for me. The reason I think it wasn't as impactful for me is that this book is mostly just a collection of events and anecdotes from Jeanette growing up and from her childhood and I just wish that she had been a little bit more descriptive not just about her experiences but also about how her experiences impacted her and changed her and what her feelings were on the things that were happening because I ended up feeling a little bit disconnected from her and her narration throughout the book and that's a nitpick like this is still a great book obviously I can see for sure why this is in the memoir canon I can see why this is so popular. After that I guess I was feeling a strong sense of chaos in my existence because every once in a while to feel alive I'm compelled to pick up a Colleen Hoover book. I feel this really bizarre and completely imaginary sense of responsibility to understand like what is popular and why it is popular and Colleen is the most popular. She's the biggest name right now. She has been for a couple of years so realistically like I know myself well enough to know that my curiosity will never be stopped. I'll probably keep picking up books by Colleen Hoover until one or both of us is being eaten by worms in the ground. I picked this one up without merit because it was one of few books that I felt like I didn't have a preconceived opinion on. Just based on the discourse that I see online, I know roughly some of the plots to a lot of her catalog or at least some of the major twists. But this one I'd heard nothing about, so I thought it would be fun to go in with fresh eyes, give this a real shot. This book is about this girl named Merritt, whose family is just really messed up. There's a total of like 10 people with the dumbest names that you've ever heard in your entire life, all living together in this abandoned church that they converted into a house after her dad somehow eminent domained away this church from this priest because the priest's dog was annoying him, even though he's not the government, like he's just a dude. I guess he just made the bank an offer that they can't refuse. Nobody knows for sure legally how that worked out for them, but just a lot of people are living in one location and a lot of things are happening here and none of them are good. That's what's going on in this book. I gave this 1.5. Say what you will about Colleen Hoover, but her books are definitely compulsively readable. Like I will blow through one of her books in about three hours if I'm left to my own devices. Like they're definitely good for that if that's what you're looking for. Colleen just loves like rolling a D20 for whatever trauma all of her characters are going to have. And this book just tried to do so much with everyone and just ended up doing it all very badly. But believe it or not, not that I need to keep rambling about this book forever. And also, if you haven't noticed by the lighting getting worse, the sun is actively setting. And if I don't finish this video by the time it's in the ground, then I'll just start crying on camera. But my main gripe with this story is that Colleen is clearly trying to do something here in terms of mental health and mental health representation. The main character, Merritt, is depressed, but she doesn't even have that word to describe what she's going through and what she's feeling until most of the way through the book. And the main plot of this book is her dealing with that while also trying to survive being inside of this incredibly deranged family with all of their terrible dynamics with each other. And sometimes in service of that plot, Colleen will drop bars about mental health, even if they're the most cliche things in the galaxy, the most like level zero understanding how to accept yourself things in the world. There's still pretty good statements about your depression not being your fault and about mental disorders being just as treatable and unfortunate as any physical injury that somebody else might have in Merritt's life and both deserve care. Just stuff like that where I, as the reader, I'm like, wow, Colleen, you know, I didn't expect this from you. Like you're actually doing a decent job. But the love interest in this book, who is also saying a lot of those positive things about mental health acceptance, he just starts telling Merritt a few different times that he didn't find her likable when she was in the trenches of her depression. And in the book, on days where she goes outside or like socializes more, he'll go up to her and be like, you were really easy to like today. As if that's a nice thing to say to someone. And as if you can like Pavlov somebody out of being mentally ill by like conditioning them by only loving them on days when they're easy to handle. And it's made even worse for me when towards the end of the book in one of the last few chapters, he's sleeping and Merritt like leans over him and whispers into his ear, I think you're easy to like every day. Like, 
my heart was just broken for her in that moment. Like you can't normalize only loving people when they're at their best and then expect me to take anything else that that character is saying about mental health seriously. It's just like such an awful thing to say to someone. So yeah, I hated that. Anyways, after that, I read five books for a thriller vlog. We're really running out of time here. So I'm going to like zoom through these because I literally just posted this video. If you want to know my expanded thoughts, you can watch it. It'd be really cool. It was a fun time. It was very spooky. That's the vibe of that video. But first off, I read The Housemaid, which I gave a 3.5, which maybe is too nice. But honestly, I don't really care. Like this is my list, okay? This is not a very good book, but it is very fun. Like it's trashy. It keeps you on your toes, even if I did see a lot of it coming. And it reminded me of binging very, very quickly a season of one of those terrible teen TV dramas where there's like a poorly conceived plot twist every single episode and people are dying left and right between getting manicures. And there's just chaos that is continuing to balloon in the background until the show is impossible to describe to any of your friends. And you also don't want them to watch it because you know it's terrible. Those are guilty pleasures for me. And this book activated a sense of nostalgia that reminded me of those feelings. So I enjoyed it for what it was. Take that as you will. Next up, I followed up with Lock Every Door by Riley Sager, who I hated as a result of really disliking Final Girls before reading this book. But now we are tentatively friends again until he disappoints me once more. This is a pretty slow paced and very atmospheric thriller that takes place in a mysterious apartment complex. And it follows this girl who accepts this handsomely paid position as an apartment sitter. And everything seems great. It seems too good to be true. And then in fact, it is too good to be true. And she realizes that to say the least, there are some strange things afoot in the apartment complex. I gave this book 3.5 as well. I thought that the tension was great in this book. And while I predicted some of the things that ended up happening, there was still a lot that surprised me. And I really enjoyed the direction of the ending, even if some parts of it did feel goofy kind of by the end. Next up, I read the sleeper pick from that video for sure, which is in my dreams, I hold a knife. I gave this 4.5 stars. I thought it was excellent. This is a dark academia flavor of a classic whodunit mystery. And it follows these six friends who have kind of all fallen out of touch, but meet up again for a 10 year class reunion at college. And when they were in college, because of course, one of their friends was murdered. But it turns out that the person that they thought did the murdering probably did not actually do the murdering. And it was one of the other people in the friend group. And the book is just them unpacking like secret after secret, just uncoiling all of the absolutely ridiculous relationship drama that exists between all of the people in this group. And there's a lot because they're insane. The only thing I didn't love about this book is that all of the characters are like terrible people. And that's fine to me on the surface for a thriller. But the resolution of this book just kind of was weird with the way that all of the relationships ended up finishing out. It just made me feel a little bit off at the end. But the ride, the journey, outstanding. Strong recommendations, especially if you're in a reading slump. I have three more books and it's getting so dark. The next book I read for that vlog was Pretty Girls by Karen Slaughter. And this book is about these two sisters who fell out of touch many, many years ago and then reunite in the wake of a murder that feels somehow connected to the mysterious disappearance of their other sister many, many years ago when they were all still living at home. I cannot properly capture without spoilers or in this time frame before I am left in darkness how just absolutely messed up this book is. This should be marked off with like caution tape at Barnes and Noble, in my opinion. I felt physically ill reading sections of this book. It was not a good time. And yet I also could not rest until I discovered what happened, until I learned how things would turn out for the girls. I ended up giving this four stars. It's a complicated book for me to read just because of how heavy the subject matter is. But ultimately, I think that with proper warning, if you're the kind of person to like this book, you will love it. And also emotionally, this packed an unexpected punch. Like this is a thriller. You would not expect me to be crying at the resolution of this book, but there I was. Okay, I have footage of that happening. So definitely a wild ride from start to finish for sure. And the last book I read for that video was None of This Is True by Lisa Jewell. This book is very loosely about a true crime podcast that goes terribly wrong. It spirals completely out of control for the podcaster as a direct result of the absolutely unhinged life of the woman at the center of the podcast that the podcaster is making. I hope that made sense. I absorbed this into my body in one day. The storytelling is great. The writing style is very fast paced and the suspense of it all was just built up very masterfully throughout the story. But with all of that said, I only ended up giving it four stars just because the ending did not hit as hard for me. Like it's not bad. It's just not exactly what I expected would come out of this book. I found it to be a little bit underwhelming, but it's still a really, really good book. And in the 11th hour with the sky turning dark, the last book that I read for this video, very appropriately spooky, is The Last House on Needless Street. I picked this book up for Halloween because it's a spooky book. I was feeling kind of brave. I wanted to read an actual horror novel for the holiday to celebrate. And I can't tell you very much about the plot of this book without spoiling the really effective way that the book creates tension. So all I will say is that this is about a man who lives in a house with his daughter and their sentient cat. Yes, the cat is sentient. It has its own perspective chapters in the story. This book is just wild like that. Okay. <laughs> if you've ever wondered what desperation looks like, it looks like my camera SD card filling up. Me not being able to find a new SD card, scared of wasting too much time and having the sun like actually set. So I'm just gonna film the last minute of this video on my phone because I refuse to be stopped. Anyways, yeah, you have this family who's living in this house and they're all kind of spooky, but things really start to go awry for them when a woman moves in to the previously uninhabited house next door to this family. That is when things start cooking and that is also when my description of this book stops. Overall, I gave this book 4.5 stars, which is higher than I expected it 
it to get for sure. Ostensibly, this is a horror novel, but I also found it to be very emotionally poignant and just really intense and hard hitting in unexpected ways. And the way that the twists in the story were executed as just like a slow growing awareness of what's going on was just everything. It was just so good. There's a really common trope in scary movies and also I'm sure scary books like I just don't really read many horror novels but I see it mishandled like all of the time and this book is just a really good subversion of that phenomenon. So if you are a scary movie enjoyer if that sounds interesting to you then I think this would be a great book for you. It was just a really unique reading experience that I think I'll remember for a long time but that's everything. I'm sure that this video turned out again way longer than I wanted it to be. I just have no sense at all about how long things take or how long anything will be or how much time there really even is in a day. None of those things are known by me. But we're done talking for now. I'll see you in the next video. I have some pretty cool things I'm cooking up for November and hopefully filming for the next wrap up will go a little bit more smoothly. If you like this video, please tell me by pressing thumbs up. If you like me, you should subscribe because I need the validation. I actually hate myself. Ha! Ah, that's like 85% joke, but you should stick around. It's a really good time. And I'm off. I'm leaving. I don't have anything else to say. Bye!